inviting us for the keynote talk. Um, are you guys sleepy after lunch? Yeah, the, hopefully the talk is not that boring, so that <laughs> we can, you guys can um, get some refreshed. So, um, yeah, my name is Jay Young Do, you can just call me Jay. And um, as a half of the first part of the keynote talk, I want to um, introduce you about the Soft Flash project um, I'm living at MSR. So, basically, I want to give you some kind of um, little bit higher level idea of the why, how I started this project and then what we are working on. And then Vladimir will um, describe the actual device which allows the in situ processing and then some interesting application scenarios we are working, to working together. So let me uh, start with the cover story of The Economist published May 2017. So what do you think about the, the, the most valuable resource in the world? So a century ago probably the answer was oil. But now, these days, probably the answer should be data, which is the uh, oil of the digital era. Um, so whether you are going for a run, or um, uh, sitting in traffic, or even watching a TV, virtually every activity creates a uh, digital trace, which is data, um, through your smartphones, smart watches, or even cars connected to the internet. So some people estimate that um, uh, in a, in near future, a self-driving car will generate like a, a huge amount of data at the 100 gigabytes per second. So simply, data is everywhere and the volume is increasing. And what can you do with such a huge volume of data? Value. We can extract values from data, such like a, um, uh, we can predict when a customer is going to buy something or when a person will be at a, will be at a risk of disease. Such kind of predictions can be possible by um, extracting values from data by using some advanced technologies like uh, uh, big data analysis or artificial intelligence like uh, deep learning. So <clears throat> to me, the very natural question is not only uh, uh, storing such a huge volume of data on these three devices, but also how can you um, process them efficiently and then uh, effectively extract the values from the uh, such a huge volume of data. So which, is, which means, to me it is obvious that we need uh, some kind of infrastructure for um, the volume of data and also for the velocity of the data. So to get uh, uh, some better understanding of the current situation, let's look at the one flash storage server we can found in the Open Compute Project. So Open Compute Project is an organization that shares the um, designs of the many um, data center components among the among companies, including Microsoft and other big companies. So here, to store large volumes of data, definitely we need many flash SSDs like that. And usually flash SSDs, some flash SSDs are grouped together, and they are connected to the PCI switches. And then those PCI switches are also connected, grouped together, and connected to the host machine, where the, um, the some compute resources like a DRAM and CPU exist. Um, of course, we can think about building a specialized server where the flash SSDs are directly attached to the host machine, but um, obviously that is kind of expensive than this commodity ar uh, architecture we can, we can easily find in the current data center. So in this, in this talk, we can, uh, we'll focus on the commodity server architecture. Uh, in this architecture, if we want to store more data, then it's easy. We can scale up by adding more storage devices. But as increasing the number of storage devices, we will see a higher cost of moving data from a storage site to the place where the compute has happened. Um, so to, to, let's do so, a simple math, actually, not very complicated. So how much um, cost of the moving data from storage to the uh, compute place is needed by doing some, let's, let's figure that out by doing some simple math. So if you think about the one flash SSD, and if you open the one flash SSD, usually it contains many flash channels where um, a set of flash memories is attached. So in the enterprise level flash SSD, usually it contains 16 or 32 flash channels. So in this example, let's suppose each flash SSD contains 32 flash channels. Then um, since the, each flash channel can keep up with roughly 500 megabytes per second, 
then we can maximally we can expect internally 16 gigabytes per second bandwidth inside the flash SSD. And in this architecture, in this example, since there are 64 flash SSDs, if you multiply these two numbers, then the aggregated internal band maximum internal bandwidth we can expect like one terabyte per second. But on the left side, on the host interface speed is not that huge. So if we use the 16 lanes of the Gen 3 PCI um, 3, then we, theoretically we can expect like a 16 gigabytes per second. So <coughs> simply we can see there is a huge throughput gap between this host interface and the storage side. So what's the what's the way what's the what's the way to actually leverage this amazingly fast aggregated internal bandwidth available inside the storage device inside the flash SSD? So we think one way to do that is uh, by making the flash SSD computable and the programmable. We can run some user applications inside the device without moving data from the storage side to the host machine. So actually, in data center, uh, many components are programmable. And I think the software-defined control and management is an inevitable trend. So one example we can find from the networking space. If you think about the network card or networking router, they are programmable to uh, provide some enhanced functionalities like a more granular um, traffic management or deep telemetry or security. As another, another example, we can um, find another example from the graphic card. So initially, the graphic processing units, GPUs, were um, developed only for the multimedia applications. So they shipped with the hard-coded multimedia functionalities. But now, as you guys know, these are heavily being used for the uh, AI applications. So um, one lesson we can learn from this trend is that um, by making some components programmable, we can um, support the rapidly changing requirements from data center without physically changing hardware itself. So I think the next target is obvious storage. But the such programmability is not available in storage. I mean, um, Vladimir introduced the next generation of the storage device where this such programmability is possible. But when I say storage, I mean the storage devices de mainly deployed to the current data centers. The current data center storage devices do not have this such programmability. So I think there is a major disconnect in terms of the innovation speed between the operation system and applications running in the cloud environment and the storage system in cloud, cloud storage infrastructure. So what does this mean? I mean, if you think about the application and operating system running in cloud environment, they are uh, patched every week with uh, some improved functionalities or bug fixes. But um, if you think of the storage devices, they are not replaced every week. They are replaced with the new ones um, during the life cycle of three to five years. It is very interesting because unlike the hard disk drives, mainly uh, the, the performance of soft flash SSD itself it largely depends on the, how the software inside SSD is implemented. But currently, the, the software uh, is de de developed by the device vendors as a proprietary firmware, and which is now open to the um, regular uh, pr application programmers. So even though a large portion of the software can be customizable for better performance, simply it is not possible. So we can, we're going to be stuck at a, a device whose functionality and capabilities are frozen in the, during the lifetime of three to five years. And this can be a problem also because the, um, uh, actually in the cloud world, the three to five years is kind of eternal, where the, uh, the new platforms and new APIs are evolving in orders of the month, and the new um, <coughs> application demanded requirements from the stories are, is evolving very fast. So ultimately, this um, being frozen in such an um, old system, old storage system, can ultimately impact the um, negative impact to the, the speed of innovating the whole cloud world. So I think that this can be solvable by making the storage devices also programmable, like other data, co data center components. So fully programmable storage devices can provide some opportunities to better bridge the gap between the operating system and application requirements and the storage capabilities and limitations. So, okay, so programmable storage devices is, seems like a good 
idea, but the question is whether the current flash SSDs can be programmable. This is the before answering the pro, before making the program with three devices. We can think we need to a little bit uh, think about whether current SSDs are as capable of running some user defined programs. So um, the right figure shows the the current PCI flash SSDs in a different form factors. So actually, if you open the flash SSD. It's not like a dumb device like hard disk drive. It already contains um, some components, storage components, and compute components to run some user-defined programs. So on the right side, the flash memory, the storage component, even in this single device case, we can see some throughput uh, gap between the host machine and the um, single SSD side. So single, as I mentioned before, one enterprise level SSD can contain 16 to 32 flash channels. So um, in this single device, inside the SSD, we can expect like um, 8 to 16 gigabytes per second. And on the host side, um, I mean the single device probably used the lane, two lanes or four lanes PCI Gen 3, which is like uh, 4 gigabytes per second or expected like a 2 to 2.5 gigabytes per second. So we can, even in the single device case, we can expect some, some kind of throughput gap from the 2x to the 8x. And also, Flash SSD contains some embedded processor and some, some amount of RAM actually may need to run some um, in SSD management tasks. So there have been some efforts to use existing flash SSDs to run some applications. So I think the, the, the very first project to explore this kind of area is the Smart SSD project. So actually this is the project um, I did during my PhD study and at the time my advisor and I sit down together and then we thought about, hey, this is, it seems like a cool idea, but we are not sure whether this is actually, this is possible. So we found, we contacted a various uh, SSD vendors to uh, convince them to realize our idea. And then one day Samsung contacted me, uh, me and then they opened some, the, they gave me some permission to access their firmware and to realize, to, act, to test this idea. So at the time, the goal was to explore the opportunities and also find the challenges to run some user-defined programs inside SSD in the context of database. So there is no PCA SSD at the time, so we just test SSD. And also we modified the uh, Microsoft SQL Server to offload some database operations like um, um, scanning and aggregation. And then um, these operators were hard-coded into the firmware on the SSD, and then we test it. So these left figures show uh, um, briefly how it works. So on the left side is, is the base case, and the right side is the smart SS case. In the regular SS case, just we need to read the data from the regular SSD and do some aggregation and then return the result to the, host, to the user. But in the smart SS case, we um, ran the hard-coded scan and pre-aggregation operators after fetching data from the flash memory and then pass the uh, some only results to the host machine on the, on, the, on, the, on the host side to some residual computation. Uh, with the smart SSD, we ran the TPCH query 6, and we got a little performance improvement and some and savings, but we observed much, much severe challenges, actually. So first challenge was a device became a performance bottleneck very easily. So uh, in this case, we use an embedded processor, which does not have the L1 and L2 caches. So it incurs a very expensive random access cost whenever randomly access the, DRAM, uh, the data in, in DRAM. So running the usual defined programs, uh, the device itself became a performance bottleneck very easily. And uh, I think the more bigger problem is the de development environment was not fully ready at the time. So the reason why we uh, compiled the, our hard-coded operator into the firmware of the SSD is, was because that's the only way to actually run the user defined some kind of operators with the, uh, inside the SSD. So whenever we uh, modify something or we fix the bug, we have to recompile the firmware and we burn the SSD, test it, and then we recompile the formula every time, which was really tedious. Uh, another problem was that there is no uh, uh, debugging software actually to debug the program. So we had to use the hardware debugging tool, which is something like this box, and then we attach the SSD to this box, and set a breakpoint, uh, turn on the machine, set a breakpoint, 
and I forgot actually. Uh, so there's some some boring and tedious work to even 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 um, find the value of the one parameter. So compared to the general software debugging tool like Visual Studio, <coughs> that was very primitive. So we concluded at the time that everything was not ready to actually to run some user defined programs inside the device. So about three years later, um, uh, the Samsung folks were um, actually tried to um, make some improvement in this area. So they used their at the, their latest at the time their latest PCI SSD to run some data intensive queries inside SSD. Not only by using the embedded processor, but also use some hardware accelerators. So in, in this project, they modified a variation of MySQL, and then to, to uh, run some early filtering of the data um, inside the device by using the pattern matching engine. And also, they developed the uh, data, uh, um, data flow model-based framework, which is called Basket. So b due to this framework, I said, one beauty of this fr framework is actually we don't have to actually recompile the firmware of the SSD to uh, run the updated version of the user-defined program. So this framework allows dynamically loading the, the binary into the firmware and then run that allows to run that uh, binary <coughs> as, as running the firmware inside the SSD. So um, they ran the, uh, some, some filtering query, simple filtering query, and they got some more than 10x speed up, which is good. But still, um, the, the computing resource inside the PCI SSD was not that uh, enough to run the, powerful enough to run the user-defined programs compared to the host, um, host processors. So they used like a 750 megahertz processor, which is much weaker than the, ho the cloud host server processor power. But also, and also, even though they introduced the framework, um, the new framework means that the existing applications, some part of the existing application have to modify to use that framework. Um, actually, it is, it is durable, but for the big applications like a SQL Server, it's not that, it is, it's not that easy to modify, the, um, modify the, some layers of, the, um, layers of the applications that have been developed for the more, than, more than 10 years. So um, in past efforts, um, we found that there's not enough spare processing power. Actually, this is obvious to me because for the packaged SSD, there's no need to add more power to run the user defined programs. The processing power that is enough to run the SSD management task, that's enough. So, but again, since the embedded processors are enough only to run the uh, in SSD management tasks, there's no room to run the user defined programs. And there are some hardware architecture limitations as well. And the programming tools are not application developer friendly. And more importantly, I think the device, the, this kind of programmable device is not accessible for other people. So the, in my case, I was able to do that because Samsung contacted me. And then Samsung guys definitely can do that because they can modify whatever they want. But other researchers, it's not that easy actually to access, to get some, um, get some prototype device to, to test some, some, some ideas. Fortunately, I think there are some changes um, that help us explore um, the in-SSD programmability easier than before. The first trend, I think, is the, uh, the resources available inside the SSD is getting powerful. So compared to the embedded processor uh, a few years ago, now we have the um, general purpose, multi-core, low power performance, low power processor. And also we have the multi-gigabytes of DRAM and some hardware accelerators like a decompression compression or pattern matching or encryption decryption. So resources available inside SSS is getting powerful. And another trend I think which is important is um, the, we are moving toward to uh, use the server-like operating system, which is something like a Linux, compared to the uh, proprietary formula level operating system. So I think the second trend is really important because the, by using the server-like operating system, uh, the application developers do not have to spend their tremendous hours to get familiar with the, 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 the embedded processing, embedded development environment. They can keep focusing on what they are working on right now by reusing the existing libraries, tools, and expertise. Um, 
So these two trends actually enables us to revisit this um, program SSD project. And these are the basis of the soft flash project. So the goal of the soft flash project is to embrace the flash SSDs as a first class programmable platform in the cloud data center. So uh, we want to add some custom capabilities to storage over time. And we want to better bridge the gap between the application requirements and the flash media capabilities and limitations. You have to innovate everything at the cloud speed. So um, eventually, we want to provide some hardware prototype software framework, which includes the SDK and the application scenarios. But now we are focusing on the application scenarios by using the, um, by using the hardware prototype developed by a manufacturer by NGD Systems or other, other groups. So <coughs> now let me um, uh, describe, introduce some of the value propositions we can think in the application scenario. So the first application scenario is the near data processing, which is obvious, that's just moving compute closer to data. So if you think about the big data analysis, um, the need to analyze big data is imposing a shift from um, um, compute centric model to the data centric model. Uh, in, this, in this model, the, the, the application performance is not driven by the, the cost of arithmetic instructions, but, also, but it is mainly driven by the cost of moving data from the storage to the host machine um, where the computer has happened. So by running something inside a device, not only we can leverage the fast inside a bandwidth, but also we can expect like a low latency to the flash medium because we can avoid uh, overrides the kernel stacks or IO, IO stacks, which increase, which increase the IO latency. So uh, in the later slides, I'm gonna uh, introduce some preliminary result. So let me skip uh, this application area for a moment. In the second application type we can um, do uh, with the programmable SSD is we can make a Zio flexible storage device. So, so let's suppose we have a new um, feature which we want to add into the SSD. Then we, what we have to do is, as a software guy, is we have to convince, we have to persuade the standardization bodies and then some device vendors to, um, to, to convince them why this is kind of a cool feature, a new feature that has to be included in the device then we have to wait until, until they get convinced and then they implement this fe new feature into their um, new generation of the hardware. Um, the, obviously, this kind of, it this takes some, some time. So if the, the, the SSD itself is fully programmable, then uh, we, instead of waiting for them to implement a new feature, we can implement some uh, new, new, new feature inside the device and then we can expand the interface beyond the block interface. So as an example, let's think about the streamer or flash. So um, let me briefly explain what this is and then what happens in the in, in Microsoft scenario. So let's suppose data is coming from two data streams to the regular SSD. And then the, the bottom side, we have the two flash blocks. And the, each flash block contains eight flash pages. In regular SSD, there is no way to distinguish whether the data is coming from stream 1 or stream 2. So um, and in the SSD side, all the, all the data are going to be mixed together. So block A contains some data from data stream 1 and some data from the stream 2. So now let's suppose that we want to delete all the data belonging to the, the data stream 1. Then um, as shown here, we're going to have some holes in the block A and then two holes in the block B. And if we want to reuse the block A, then uh, first we have to copy the valid pages, two valid pages to the, uh, to the erased block, and then we are gonna erase the whole block A. A better approach would be if the device were able to actually distinguish the data streams, and if the data streams were tagged with the, ta the stream ID, then SSD will, um, gather the data from the stream 1 to the block A and the gather data from stream 2 to block B. Then if the, all the data belonging to data stream 1 gets deleted, then there's no need to actually move the data uh, from A to another valid 
uh, the erased block. We can just erase the whole block A. So this kind of stream aware, aware feature, uh, Microsoft um, Cloud guys actually wanted to do this feature like uh, four to five years ago. But um, very recently, this has been standardized. But that does not mean actually we can, uh, we can use, we can leverage this feature right away. We have to, we might have to actually wait another year to make a purchase plan to buy devices supporting this kind of feature. And also we might need to wait a couple more years for the application guys to modify the application to um, use this feature. So I think the, uh, the fully programmability uh, will allow the um, uh, innovate the, 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 the APIs and the new features at the cloud speed without waiting for any, any other th third parties. Another example I'm working on right now is a key value SSD. So uh, these days they are in the market. There are many log structured key value stores that um, is optimized for the, for the use of the flash SSDs, for example, the RocksDB. So in this kind of key value store, they use the log structuring um, mechanism to avoid the random write and simply just append the new versions of the page at the end of the log. But since it is the, the pages are getting appended, definitely the cleaning process is needed to reclaim the, the first uh, the head, head of the log and the mapping tables also needs to be uh, periodically checkpointed. So if the crash happens, the, check, the contents of the mapping table has to be reloaded to use the data um, persisted on the storage device. But in modern SSDs with their FTLs already have the, uh, some kind of log structured implementations inside the device. So I think there are many duplicated functionalities between the, um, the, the log structured key value store applications and then the device itself. So if the, uh, the, the SSDs are fully programmable and then you can expand the, the block interface, then we can make the key value store SSD by expanding the block interface and reuse the, uh, some existing functionalities inside the SSD. So third types of application we can think of is the secure computation in cloud. So security is really important. Uh, I think the, this is one of the top most concerns that the enterprise CIOs um, uh, decide whether to move data from their on-premise on uh, uh, servers to the cloud servers. So I think the secure, uh, secure, good secure in cloud is not an improvement feature. It's kind of essential and the basic functionalities that is really, really required for the future data cloud model and for the success in the industry. So to realize this secure, um, the good secure, secure in cloud world, currently the data has to be encrypted and stored on the storage device. But there is uh, only a limited number of operations that can be directly performed on the encrypted data. So the, to, to perform some, um, some computations, the encrypted data first has to be loaded from the storage device to host machine, and then decrypted over there, and then do some computation. But Decrypting the, uh, the encrypted data at the host side means that um, at least temporarily uh, some, some clear text has to be present at various portions of the data center, which is vulnerable to the um, security attack. So I think that uh, uh, one better approach could be um, instead of the uh, encrypting data at the host side, just put the the, to put the data inside the device and do some encryption inside the device by using some, um, some hardware accelerator, encryption hardware accelerator. Then when the computation is needed, um, instead of loading the encrypted data to the host machine and decrypt over there, just do the decrypt the data inside the device by also by using the hardware accelerator and do the computation and only send the results to the host machine. In this way, uh, we can make the uh, SSD as a trusted domain for secure computation and um, without leaving the clear text outside of the device. So, uh, so far we have uh, briefly uh, visited some three value propositions um, that can be uh, uh, realized with the help of the program of SSDs. The moving can be closed with data and Azure flexible storage and a secure computation. So, um, now let's a little bit more focus on the, um, the near data processing. So uh, again, the big data analysis, the, uh, the, the overall performance of the big data analysis is not driven by the 
uh, is driven by the, actually the cost of moving data from the storage to the, to the host machine. So in this, uh, in this big data analysis, we try to use a program SSD to run, again, to run some database operations again, but with the much powerful ARM processors and some hardware accelerators. So one of the beauty of using the program SSD and running some applications inside SSD compared to host machine is uh, the SSD components are much energy efficient. So we might be able to actually, instead of running the application on the host side by using, by using some expensive um, energy cost, we might be able to actually build a more balanced server, uh, which is the total cost of ownership by, um, run, by using some energy efficient components inside the device. So here's a, uh, a, a brief description of the scenario. We have the storage cluster, and then we have a compute cluster over there, and this cluster has the node. And uh, for the basic operation, we first fetch the compressed data from the storage cluster. Usually to save the storage space, data has to be compressed before, um, before being stored on the storage device. So we loaded the compressed data from the storage device, storage cluster, and the decompressed data on the compute side, and then decode the data as well, and then do some required computations. If we have the uh, programmable SSDs, then um, BC and the parts of the D can be offloaded to the storage device. We can use a decompression engine also instead of the ARM processor to decompress the data, then decode, and then do some computation, partial computation, and then uh, residual computation is done by the compute cluster. So we uh, modify the Hive to um, get some premium number to see how much performance we can get by using this prototype device. So um, this is just a research prototype which has the um, full lane PCIe Gen 3 to, um, to connect this device to the host machine. And there is a two full lane PCIe Gen 3 PCIe slots to attach a storage card that I'm going to explain in the next slide. And this guy has the four ports, um, internet ports, which supports RDMA. And there are four core ARM processor, 60 gigabytes of DRAM, and there are some hardware accelerators like uh, compression, encryption, and pattern matching. And there are two different types of the storage boards. Uh, one is a DIMM type, and the other was M.2 adapter. In the DIMM adapter, there are four DIMM slots, so we can put the uh, DRAM or uh, NAND flash or other NVM memories when they are available. And they are FPGA for the storage controller. In the M.2 uh, adapter, we can put regular M.2 SSDs or we can put the M.2 open channel SSDs as well. So by using this protein, we try to scan the Zelda compressed um, integer data set on a um, X, uh, on a server, and in the other case, inside a programmable SSD. So in this, ex in this ex experiment, we used only a single core for better comparison. So in this chart, y-axis shows the throughput, um, millions of rows per second, and x-axis shows a different uh, environment. So the leftmost one is the, uh, the host case, the middle one is the program SSD, when you only use the ARM processor, and the rightmost one is the same, the same program SSD, um, but the, the decompression logic is offloaded to the decompression hardware accelerator. So if we compare the first bar and the second bar, it is obvious that the program SSD shows worse performance because the simply the ARM processor power is uh, weaker than the power of the host Xeon processor. But if we compare the first bar and the third bar by offloading uh, the compute intensive intensive operation, which is a decompression operation, into the hardware compression logic, we can get some like a roughly 5x performance improvement. So this is the, uh, uh, the point of the point of thing I want to say in this preliminary experiment is this is just a single device experiment. So if in, in the real data center server there are multiple um, SSDs, more than, definitely more than 10 and up to like a 40 or it depends on the server architecture. But if we used more than like a 40 program SSDs, then we can exhibit much, much higher performance improvement. So another, um, another application uh, we are working on um, is the image similar research. So 
uh, probably you guys know what the image stimulus search is. You can imagine like a Bing uh, image search or Google image search. I personally I have never used the Bing image search. Only used Google image search though. So. So image search is simply like a, um, given a database which contains multiple different images. So when a query image is, is given, find the similar images. So in this example, there are hot, uh, um, balloon images given as a query. Then we are going to select only the first and the third images because they are similar. So um, in system-wise, to, to, um, there are many different ways of getting the ima similar images from the database. But in a state of art uh, techniques, usually we use the convolutional neural network to extract some feature vector from an image um, to make a, a, a few hundred or few thousand dimension feature vector. Uh, we do that for the query image, and we do the same thing for the database images as well. And they put everything into the memory. And if the two images are similar, then it tends that um, the, the, the feature vectors extracted those two images. The distance of the feature vectors extracted from the, those two images are also very, very close. So we calculate the distance of the feature vector of the query image versus the, against the feature vectors of database images. We calculate the distance and then try to get the pretty close um, feature vectors having the close distances. So this is good, but uh, that this this architecture has some problem. Um, not to, for the for the for better performance, it's uh, in the current state of our techniques. All the um, the feature vectors are gonna be put into the memory. So um, as far as I know, the um, the the latest latest technique only uh, search the one billion images with the this red circle with the one hundred twenty eight dimension. So with 128 dimension and the 1 billion images, the whole data set size is like a, um, a few hundred gigabytes, which is a durable to put that everything into the memory. But if we increase the number of the um, images, database images, or if we increase the number of the dimensions of the feature vector, we will see the data set size is incremental, uh, exponentially increased like that. So let's suppose if we have the eight billion images with, with the 2,000 dimension, then um, 64 terabytes of data, putting everything inside the memory does not really make sense. So there should be some way to uh, get this similar, to do the similar search when the database size is really, really huge. And second problem is actually, if the database size is huge, then uh, it is like that um, the compute um, dominated operations are actually shifting to the, the IO, IO dominant operations. So in this chart, we uh, estimate actually the number of elapsed time that is taken for the IO operation and CPU operation for one billion vector in 2K dimension, um, this blue circle case. So as you can see here, uh, if we use the, uh, this kind of data set, the most of the time, most of the last search less time is taken by the IO search, the IO time, not the CPU to actual computation time. So, um, so in this case, actually, by use, by running the same application inside a device, we can leverage the high, really high throughput internal bandwidth. So we can expect um, some 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 performance improvement for the same application. So. Uh, in the next slide, uh, Vladimir will introduce how we actually um, um, the run the similar search with a real device the NGD systems is developing. Thank you, Jay. Yes. Thank you very much, Jay, for the introduction. Um, <coughs> so, uh, first of all, just a few words. It's really exciting to be working with Jay and, and his team on, on this project. We've been um, for a long time thinking about uh, how to make uh, SSCs more intelligent. Uh, it was a different path than the one that Jay mentioned. Uh, I've been working with SSCs and designing SSD controllers uh, since 2005, as Jay, uh, as, as Felipe mentioned. And you know, as we went along and, and work on enterprise SSDs, we saw the opportunities to bring acceleration, compression, encryption, 
deduplication functions inside the SST and then as the time went by I was just always wondering okay what if we could make it like even more programmable have add more stuff to to the SSD functionality <coughs> and then this opportunity of uh, uh, starting uh, a, a company a startup company uh, came along and this is one of the things that uh, we are trying to bring so all of the work and the technology that we have developed uh, centers around the concept of moving computation to data and the fact that it's cheaper and more effective uh, why because it minimizes network traffic uh, it increases the effective throughput and performance of the system and we're going to show how and uh, and actually enables the distributed processing in a very seamless way so think about it uh, as a very similar concept and what you see with Hadoop or MapReduce where you're trying to push the computation to the storage, the, the servers that contain the data that you want to manipulate. So we're doing it at a different scale and Jay already presented the, the concept but it's important to kind of repeat that. So this is especially effective for big data and big data analytics where you're dealing with very large sets of, of uh, unstructured or semi-structured data. The traditional approach of using uh, high-performance servers uh, coupled with uh, you know, network storage SAN and NAS boxes uh, ends up being uh, a factor that uh, limits uh, the, the network, networking bottlenecks uh, end up limiting your performance. So uh, just a few words about uh, our company's vision and value proposition. It's not uh, any form of uh, uh, propaganda, but I uh, just wanted to say that in terms of vision, we want to create a paradigm shift by bringing computation to storage. Uh, and our value proposition comes with delivering a storage device that is power efficient, and we measure this as in watts per terabytes, uh, which is a different metric that's starting to get traction in the industry and people realizing that this is very important. Uh, lower cost, and by uh, bringing intelligence to the storage and, and we do it in this case with a technology that we call in-situ processing. So the concept is the same, we have our own implementation of computational storage. There are other people working in the field and I think uh, we want to present another paper that talks about some of these implementations. So uh, just in a few words just to set the context, how does, does, how does this work? So you just imagine, uh, this is a very simple picture the, uh, uh, depicting a, a typical CPU with uh, one or more host processors, their associated memory, and one or more storage devices. In this case, we're showing SSDs, right? And the, the flash media is the one that uh, is used to store the data that you're going to manipulate. So the first thing is a very important task is to move the data in, in a performer write where you store the, the, the data. So in, in, in frameworks like Hadoop, for example, there's an initial phase where you push all the data Right, and you populate everything. So you move from, let's say, from a data lake to a, a Hadoop cluster. This is a very important phase. Then when, once you want to uh, uh, process that data, examine it, mine it, whatever you want to do, what you need to do is read this data from the storage device into the memory of the CPU and then perform computation. And since we're talking very, very large data sets, you can imagine that this is, has to be done many 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 times because the data sets do not fit in DRAM right so that's a very simple picture right and once you're done you obtain results and those results can be used in the next level, layer of software application your, your application so just think for now that we have a magic box inside our SSD that's called an in-situ processing box right so you would be able to perform some sort of computation inside the drive. So that's how we started. So you do the same thing, you have to store your data. Then when you want to perform your computation, you read from the flash media and use the in-situ processing magic box multiple times until you're done with your computation. So just for now, just think very simple operation like a search, right? It will be much more efficient to perform the search locally and then just to provide the results out. So you start with a vast amount of data and you provide maybe a number. I found this pattern n times, right? So you go from terabytes to a byte. So this is the kind of stuff that makes sense. We can do more complex stuff as well. So once you get the result, you just propagate that result out. There's many mechanisms for that. I don't, I don't want to get into the details right now, but I'm going to talk about it. And then this result can be available at a higher level in other levels, layers of the application. So this computation requires 
lower power consumption, I'm not moving data around. And that's a huge component of the power consumption. And then can be performed very efficiently because, again, I, can, I do not move data. I can do this in all the storage devices that I have. I'm just showing one. I could have, as Jay mentioned, up to 64 SSDs in the most, most uh, more modern uh, platforms that are being uh, presented at, at OCP. So you can imagine the power of performing this kind of operation in parallel, right, with 64 SSDs. So just to recap, the same slide uh, that Jay presented, slightly modified, I just wanted to highlight because it's very important. Again, there is an enormous media to compute bandwidth mismatch, right? I used the same number. We've done some computations with different numbers that even show sometimes higher uh, media to compute bandwidth mismatch, but we're around two orders of magnitude. This is unbearable. So the concept just, again, is instead of computing only here, let's find in a complex application what can be processed at the storage device. And the idea is not to say, okay, I can do better with my uh, in situ processing in my SSD. I, the idea is to augment the processing power, the energy efficiencies of the whole system, not one against the other, but one plus the other. So, um, How do we start? So the important thing for us as a company is to design an SSD, stable, reliable. So that is the foundation. And what you can see here are those uh, basic building blocks that are used uh, in any SSD. On the left side, the harder basic blocks like uh, the PCI -NV protocol, NVMe protocol engines, real-time processors that uh, Jay mentioned, Error correction engines, encryption, decryption engines, uh, flash media controller, all of those are basic building blocks that are needed for an SSD to work. On the right side, you see the, the firmer building blocks, like the PCIe NVMe a software stack, the flash translation layer, which is extremely important to find the information within the flash, flash management software, which is a very important component deals with garbage collection and flash rail leveling. All of these, it's, it's, you know, designing an SSD is a humongous task. A flash microcode that runs inside the flash media controller. So you have to have that foundation ready, right? On top of that, what we've done is that we've added computational resources. So what we've, uh, in, in, the, in our first design, we've had a quad-core ARM A53 from ARM. Um, uh, and uh, also coprocessors, there's four SIMD engines, right? They're capable of running floating point operations and so on, and hooks for hardware accelerator. So we do have actually a hardware acceleration engine that does implement or accelerates the grab command, which is used in uh, searches. Um, on the right side, we have uh, built a software stack that includes our own API, uh, C, C++ libraries, and a full-fledged Linux operating system running inside the drive because we have dedicated application processors there. They're not running on our real-time processors. They're running on dedicated 64-bit application processors. And we also support container. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So the dedicated re computing resources and the hardware acceleration for data analytics, uh, together with a, a seamless programming model, makes it a, a very powerful platform. So I want to stress this and I want to stress even more in the next slide is that the programming model needs to be seamless. It's easy to add hardware, uh, but if it's not easy to program and easy to use, it will not be adopted in the industry. And obviously the scalability, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but that's very important. So just a few more words regarding the programming model and uh, the ecosystem that we're building. We're uh, providing uh, uh, Yocto uh, for developers to create their own custom Linux-based systems for embedded products. Uh, this is kind of an advanced feature, but it was useful for us at the beginning, so we keep it. We have installed, ported a uh, full-fledged uh, oper Linux operating system, in this case, the Ubuntu 16.04 and Ubuntu Core. They're both working, so we can ship drives now with uh, Ubuntu operating system. 
and we support lightweight virtualization uh, with containers and we opted right now for Docker. So this is extremely powerful because it allows us now to uh, deploy uh, applications in the field seamlessly, uh, support those applications and manage those applications uh, using frameworks like Kubernetes and others that are out there. And, and finally, something that we're working on right now is uh, to enable edge computing. So for our devices that could be at the edge, we want to be able to connect to uh, uh, cloud services that manage IoT devices like uh, Azure. Uh, and there is an Azure IoT Edge operating system that we intend to run on our drives to enable the deployment and running of uh, artificial intelligence applications, Azure services, etc. And this can also be extended to other frameworks like the ones that uh, AWS is putting for and so on. But Microsoft really seems to be ahead of the game in this area and we're you know, trying to uh, first uh, uh, integrate and, and uh, play with that ecosystem right now. So on the uh, image similarity search, uh, the work that we're, we've been performing with Microsoft Research and uh, thanks to Jay for all the support, uh, so we have chosen the Facebook AI similarity search application because it's open source. This was a suggestion coming from Jay. It's an excellent suggestion. So just to recap, in the past 10 years we went from a few million images for image similarity search to a billion images with, uh, you know, face. And the idea now is to find algorithms and architectures that will support searches over a trillion images or more. So that's a very challenging problem. We're not saying that we have solved it but we're trying to build the, the building blocks that will help solve that problem. So the idea now is, so as, as uh, Jay explained it much better than, than I can, but just remember, uh, we're talking a very large database that contains many, many images, and those images are associated to vectors that are generated using convolutional neural networks or other means. In our case, we've used uh, TensorFlow to generate some of those vectors. And there is a query that comes. That, com that query comes on a, uh, in the form of an, an image. That image needs to be converted or, um, to a vector. And then comes, comes all the algorithms and the hardware architecture to support the search for the nearest neighbors, right? And when you find the nearest neighbors, then there's other layers of application that can use that information to make some inference about the data, the, the image that you provided, right? Uh, so just a few words, so we've, uh, so just remember there's an indexing process and the search process, and we're gonna be focusing on the search process because that's what we decided to implement in the uh, uh, smart SSDs that we have used to create the system. So traditionally you would see a system where you have like a relatively powerful CPU uh, uh, that is, uh, uses uh, several hard disk drives or even SSDs, no SSDs, uh, and uh, all the, the data, the images, the metadata, the vectors are all stored here, and you perform your image similarity search, or you execute a similar image similarity search here in the CPU. So what we've done, the experiment that we ran, is that we replaced those um, storage devices by ultra high capacity SSDs that do contain a processing subsystem, as I mentioned, ARM Cortex-A53, running at 1.5 gigahertz, and four core of those, together with SIMD engines, right? Those SIMD engines that come with the ARM, they're, they're called NEON processors. So this is a diagram and a picture that shows the experiment. So we have a, a quite, par quite a, a powerful server that's connected to what's called uh, PCA Gen 3 expander. That's not a machine that you see everywhere. It's a little monster that has 16 slots of uh, PCA Gen 3. And those are the slots that we have used to populate with, with our own SSDs that uh, not only store 8 to 24 terabytes of data each, right, but also contains processing capabilities. 
Uh, this experiment was done actually in collaboration obviously with Microsoft Research but also with Orange Silicon Valley which is an, a partner in this proof of concept experiment. So I'm, I'm not going to bore you with the gory details but what we did uh, regarding the face application is that uh, in two steps. First, we, I think we were the first to take the face application and port it to the ARM 64-bit architecture. I've never seen any other port uh, right here. Yeah. And including uh, all the SIMD instructions for uh, the x86 architecture, porting that into the uh, ARM SIMD uh, instructions. So once we got it to work, we did some profiling, we looked at the code and so on, and what we decided is that, if you, if you remember, uh, there's a search pattern. So when the query comes, we have to do query management, and then we have to perform the search itself. That's what we focused on porting inside the drive itself. So um, basically, we, we decided to, to use an uh, index data set uh, for each one of the drives. So each drive that's connected to the CPU, as I showed before, will have its own data set of images. As I am increasing the size of my data set, I will have to add more SSDs. So uh, I'm going to go quickly here. So the memory footprint was uh, uh, w w the trick that we used because we used index data set uh, uh, in each of the SSDs. We can reduce the memory footprint by a lot. And this is a concern that we have for the SSD. Each SSD only supports about eight gigabytes of RAM. There's a lot of stuff to run in, so it's important to try and minimize that. But this is the way we scale. As we need more to increase the size of the data set, we keep adding SSDs. But as we add SSD, we add processing power. It's simple, right? There's no magic there, but that's how the scaling goes. And that's exactly the trend that we see in the hyperscale data centers is that how storage is scaling by adding storage devices and so we take advantage of that okay so uh, if we were not using the trick of the uh, index data set we we would need more and more and more memory and there's another effort that we're uh, working in parallel to solve that problem so right now for those experiments because we're using index data set we can reduce the memory footprint but Jay is working on a very smart algorithm to solve that problem in another way. And maybe there's going to be other papers going, coming down the pipe on that. <laughs> uh, so the first thing is that, okay, are we really augmenting the system performance? So one of the experiments that we ran was, okay, let's run with the host only, and then the host with one in situ SSD. And what happens, right? So what we notice initially is the host busy time goes down very quickly. So we get 40% reduction in the host busy time, which is very interesting, by splitting the data set. So half of the in the host only situation, we have uh, 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 all, all, the, all the images being processed by the host. In the host plus in situ, we kind of split uh, into, and we see that. So this was an encouraging result. And then we saw, okay, what about the search time? So uh, in this example where we, we actually ran with, uh, 14 drives and we extrapolated for 16 but um, the, d the data uh, actually we also ran for 15 uh, later before I finished this paper but if we take a look at the search time uh, in the very beginning of this curve I've uh, and zoomed in a little bit you can see that the host perf uh, performs the search much much faster than in situ SSD right uh, for a smaller data set. As the data set uh, size increases, I, I keep ha uh, having to add more SSDs. So I double my data set, I add another SSD, and then I add another SSD. At some point, the host takes, uh, by itself, takes about the same time than the in-situ SSD. From that point on, the, we, uh, what we measure is that an exponential increase in the search time, right, and from that point on, it becomes more interesting to use the in situ SSD in terms of search time. So when we get to 16, there is an 80x improvement in search time because the search time is still constant. Everything runs in parallel in all the SSDs. So if you can scale this way, you can actually um, 
uh, obtain a very large uh, increase in performance for very large data sets. For smaller data sets, it doesn't make sense at all. So obviously there's still some, uh, a lot of work to do from the algorithm point of view, from the, uh, um, the harder point of view, our SSD needs to run faster and so on, but this is a very encouraging result going forward. So this is just a snapshot of uh, the results that we get. We have a little web interface where we can upload pictures for the query and then we let it run on the drives. So in this case here, we uploaded a picture that was in the data set. So it's, uh, unfortunately, it's hard to see, but the distance is zero. So it found the perfect match, right? And then it found the closest neighbors and you can put as many as you want, right? And it keeps searching. Uh, in that case here, well, this is not, you see, this is not a perfect match. There's a distance here. So the cat that we uploaded, there's no match inside the data set, but it finds the closest one. But the interesting thing with similarity search is that you can find a cat like this in the corner of an image and we'll still find it. And we actually have, I should have uh, shown this one, uh, an image where there is a, a person, the face of a person, and then just a ear and a part of the eye and still finds the cat. And obviously the distance is, is longer, but you still can find. So, yes? May I, if you, uh, may I ask if you have um, trained your own network or used any pre-trained uh, pre network for this research? So... S you want to answer that? Yeah. So, uh, have you used VGG or ResNet 50 pre-trained and just, I would say, learned or, or something like that so, so me specifically or you have developed your own CRM? So no we didn't we didn't develop our own and we just used the instruction to screen for the same model. So standard model is not our interest. We can use technically we can use any standard model yeah. if it works, but after you strengthen the feature vectors that's the question you have. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. right. So the question is a search. Because once you've trained it takes a long time, it's difficult, but then after that that's where a lot of work starts. So one of the experiments, we use TensorFlow, right? And we actually, uh, and it's not part of that presentation, but we actually managed to run TensorFlow inside the drive itself, which was pretty cool. So when the query comes, you can actually uh, generate the vector inside the drive instead of in the host. It's just an experiment that we ran. So uh, I just wanted to sp uh, spend a few more minutes uh, talking about what we are, uh, how, how uh, what else we're doing in terms of uh, the user computational storage out there and um, and wanted to talk about file computing so I'm not sure if everybody's familiar with file computing but we had a, a very good talk this morning that uh, you know talked about IOT and file computing um, basically one of the ways of defining fog is that space that exists between the cloud and the edge and the edge is where all the sensors actuators um, uh, controllers are the uh, IoT devices are, and uh, there is a lot of uh, um, of effort that's being put in deploying what's being called fog nodes uh, out there. And those fog nodes perform computation, they store data, they communicate with each other and with the cloud and with the actuators. Uh, uh, and uh, there is a lot of effort in 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 deploying those fog nodes, and there are lots of challenges related to that. And, I, and, and, and what we believe is that computational storage will help a little bit on that space. So fog deployments will, will have uh, data information flowing uh, in the north-south direction from the cloud to the edge, from the edge to the cloud. Control as well, but also there is information flowing in the east-west direction, so between fog nodes, right? So in the right side, you see uh, uh, this is coming from the Open Fog Consortium. We are a member of Open Fog Consortium uh, that, that shows um, a, a simplified diagram. And you can see how complex it is of a, a smart city with traffic control and autonomous cars all interacting. What uh, 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 scientists believe is going to be the future of such a distributed sim system. So you see how complex that is. All clouds, uh, cloud is involved local uh, processing control uh, up and down from car to cloud and back etc and why is a storage company worried about this right this is a, a slide from intel 
and they have predi been predicting that each autonomous car will generate at least four terabytes of data per day, each day. There is no way in hell that all this data can be automatically uploaded to the, uploaded to the cloud nonstop, right? So we will need a lot of storage inside the car, a lot of processing, and decisions need to be made locally, and information needs to flow to the cloud, but it needs to be done in a very smart way. It cannot be the, you know, all the data being pushed to the cloud and that's it. There's a lot of decisions that need to be made with very low latency, so it's necessary to have uh, intelligence in the car. So we believe that there is, a, there is a, an opportunity there to use computational storage to solve some interesting problems in autonomous cars, also in 5G deployments, because what's going to happen is that uh, what uh, is being predicted by the telecom um, uh, uh, operators is that everywhere we're going to have IoT sensors, we're going to have cameras collecting data, a lot of data is being generated, it's, it's cost prohibitive to push it to the cloud, we're going to need uh, small footprint compute and uh, high capacity storage locally uh, and be very smart about which data to move, what to process locally, what to move to the cloud. Uh, and, 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 and this is just a, like a, an R&D effort that we're starting in our company. We've done quite a bit of, of research already on that and we're partnering up with uh, uh, players in that field and uh, hopefully I think we're, we would be right about uh, the, how computational storage can, can help with uh, uh, fog computing. So basically, just to reiterate that the challenge that we're gonna see are collection of massive amount of data, limited bandwidth to the cloud, limited available power in a very, and sometimes a harsh environment under the sun, etc. cetera. So uh, we, we believe that part of the solution, maybe a small part, is to kind of combine as much as possible storage and compute and take the most out of it. And comp being in competition to, to data is, again, a paradigm shift that can be helpful there. So, um, from my side as a conclusion, I don't know if Jay wants to add a few more words, but what we learned the past couple of years is that computational storage requires a seamless programming model. There is no way there's going to be adoption of this if the programming model isn't simple. And the fact that we are now able, uh, capable of running an operating system uh, and the fact that we uh, provide lightweight virtualization like uh, with Docker uh, help us to create a seamless programming model. The support for containers will enable large-scale deploy deployment and portability and maintenance.